Amen. Y'all, I've said it before. For a long, long time, my favorite preacher on the planet was a man named Stan Mitchell. I never in a million years thought I would be able to say he has become one of my best friends. And he has been, this is now his third time speaking here. I am beyond um, just amazed that that has happened. Would you give it up, our friend, Stan Mitchell. I suppose I'm not a good titler of sermons, but I want to talk to you today about what I would refer to as sacred endings. Sacred endings. I don't know if it was Richard Rohr or Ron Rollheiser that I heard first um, use this label, but they referred to our story, the Christian story, as embodying the Paschal cycle, Pascha coming from the word in Hebrew that meant Passover. Uh, the point was that our story is a story of, if you look at the life of Jesus, life, death, burial, resurrection, adjustment to new life, letting go, and then ultimately new life, full new life. If you back up and look at the life of Jesus, you have, you have the call in all of our life to receive the gift of life. Jesus came uh, as a divine gift to the world for himself and for others. So the Paschal Cycle reminds us that we first receive life and then after receiving life, there are moments in that life where you have to name, claim, and receive your deaths. Rollheiser says, along the way, there are Paschal deaths and there are terminal deaths. But every death in Christ, in God, can be a paschal death, a death filled with hope. Uh, the autumn of the year when the leaves come off that is followed by winter but is ultimately followed by spring. A terminal death is a hopeless death. A terminal death is fatal in all of its ways. But a paschal death has within it the seeds of new life, even if you don't see it in the moment. So in Christ... We are taught to receive life. We're taught to name and claim, to step into our deaths. And then we're also taught to accept the gift of our graves. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writing, that the good news is not just that Christ was resurrected, but Paul said the good news is that Christ died. There is good news in the death of Christ, and there is good news, he said, in the burial of Christ. And I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about that burial. The burial, Saturday, is the day that we often overlook. We have the cataclysm of Friday that we call Good Friday, the death of Christ, and then, of course, we build our entire, uh, the linchpin of our Christian faith is around the resurrection. But sandwiched between was that day that we so often slide past that day that the male disciples fled from. You remember, they couldn't take the silence of that Saturday, so they just went back to their tomb. They did what a lot of people do. They just swept it under the rug and tried to get back to life as they knew it. But there were women, and I'll talk about them today, who actually, on that Saturday, tended to the burial of Jesus. And it's not surprising that the people who were tending to the burial well were the ones who met the resurrected Christ on Sunday. And they didn't meet the resurrected Christ on Sunday because they were looking for a resurrection. They experienced the resurrection because they were tending to well to, they were tending well to the matter at hand, which was the burial. So we receive life, we name our deaths, we accept the gift of our graves, and you remember Jesus' grave was gifted to him. We accept the gift of our graves. Resurrection is about claiming our rebirth. It's about springtime. And then the Bible says that after the resurrection, there was that unusual 40-day period. You remember where he was seen. Paul didn't just say the gospel was the death, burial, and resurrection, as we often you know, prattle off. He said the gospel was that Christ died, was buried, was resurrected, and then was seen for 40 days. 40 days he was seen. 
And that 40 days, he was the same, but he was different. He looked like himself. He talked like himself. The philosophy was still the same. The love was still there. But he came and went. He walked through doors. He floated into the sky. For 40 days, there was that in-between liminal space. The Latin word liminus means threshold. And a lot of you know, Carrie knows in this wake of her husband's death and the transition that a lot of sacred stuff happens in liminal space, in threshold space. The thresholds of life are those awkward moments between two worlds. A new world that you don't know, an old world that you were comfortable with but have to let go of. It's the trapeze artist having to let go of one before it takes the other. It's Simon Peter. Liminal space is that moment when you let go of the boat but your feet have it solidly held on the water. It's that awkward, in-between, discombobulated time. So we receive life. We name death. We accept the gift of our graves and tend to them well. And that opens us up to the reception of rebirth and resurrection. But even after resurrection, we have to get our sea legs under us. A new life has to be adjusted to. And we have those 40-day periods where it's not what it was and it's not what it's going to be. It's liminal space. This is a soul-making world. It's a Christ-making universe. And much of that Christ-making happens in that moment when we've lost equilibrium, we don't have sure footing and we don't have a sure hold. As Mother Teresa said, in the absence of certainty, I learn trust. And we find that there are greater virtues than acuity and certainty and accuracy and confidence. Sometimes we have to learn trust. And then after adjusting to our new life, I mean, think about the Paschal cycle. The beauty of the gospel is that it's not just a historical record of something that happened to a man. Christ is the archetype for us all. We live this. That's why Paul said, we're buried with Christ in baptism. We rise to walk in newness of life. Immature religion focuses on a historical record, trying to get it historically accurate and simply commemorates a past life. Mature religion sees that that life is bigger than one life and it's the story of every human being who's ever lived. That's Christianity. They took him out or he took them out to a place at the end of the 40 days, the adjustment period. And the Bible said, when they saw him, they doubted and they worshiped. Isn't that amazing that that can happen in the same frame? And he didn't upbraid them and say, well, when you get rid of all the doubt, come back and worship. They doubted and they worshiped. And that's what all of us do if we would be honest with ourselves. And as they worshiped him, instead of receiving their worship, again, mature religious leaders do not set themselves up to be worshiped for thousands of years. Mature religious leaders set you up to be fully who you are. He was not an egomaniac narcissist who wanted to put a throne in the middle of the world and say, make it all about me. As a matter of fact, he looked at them a few days before and said, greater works than I have done, you'll do. And I'm gonna return to the Father who's greater than I. That dissolution back into spirit is greater than just walking around in one body. And you being the body of Christ, all of you filled, is better than just one person. Greater, you'll do. Some of the toughest words of Jesus is his claim that we would do more because a lot of time it's easier to worship someone than it is to actually live out their life. It's easier to build Rosa Parks a statue than it is to actually stand in that way and live that life. It's easier to venerate Jesus than it is to imitate Jesus. And they worshiped him. And as they worshiped him, he gave them the greatest blessing. You know what it was? He left them. Earlier, he had told Mary Magdalene, Mary, you need to let go of me. Isn't that amazing? The great commission of Jesus was go into all the world and baptize them in my name. The greatest commission of Jesus in that hour was let go of me. How many of you know, walking out your faith through the years, that you're always, Jesus is this archetypical picture of God, and the reality is God is so vast and so big that we are always in the process of letting go of one Jesus to open ourselves up to another. And of course, it's not Jesus that's changing, it's our understanding that's unfolding. 
Think about the disciples with Jesus. That is not a historical record. That's your journey with Jesus. I remember Brian McLaren in his book, Generous Orthodoxy, had a wonderful section called The Seven Jesuses I've Known. And every time Jesus is calling you to let go of him, it's not because he doesn't want to be in your life. It's because he wants to be in your life more fully. There's always a letting go of Jesus that opens us up to the new. And as he went into the heavens, the Bible said they were worshiping him. And as he left them, he blessed them. He blessed them in the leaving. That's what good religious spiritual leaders do. They bless you in the leaving. And as he blessed them, they continued to worship and the angels didn't look at them and say, that's great, build a whole religion around that. The angels said, what are you doing here? Go to Jerusalem, as he said. What happens in Jerusalem? They are, they are waiting on Jesus to come back. And you know what? He did. The early church set a record that he was going to come back. They went to Pentecost. He didn't come back in their minds. And so for 2,000 years, we've been waiting on him to come back. The reality is, at Pentecost, he did come back. He came back in the fullness of spirit. Now the body of Christ is not relegated to one bronze-skinned Galilean. Now the body of Christ is everywhere. People who claim his name and are filled with the same spirit that raised him from the dead. You are the body of Christ. And so this is the Paschal cycle. I want to read you something that I wrote because I'm too busy back home to practice this and get it down. But if you don't mind being read to, I'm a pretty good reader. I'm going to read something that I've written and I've just shared it once or twice and I want to share it with you. And it's about the Paschal cycle, particularly about the death and the burial, the part that we don't like to talk a lot about, but the part that once you get into it, you will find the richness and the beauty of it. Let me read you a poem that I read Ray last night by Edna St. Vincent Millay, one of my favorite poets. She wrote this, um, I suppose she wrote this about a hundred years ago. And I just had it, I I saw it, I was reminded of this poem. Uh, I guess two weeks ago I was watching, I was doing my research for this sermon watching a Netflix movie. The Netflix movie was called uh, The Hero, Sam Elliott. You know the guy with the big mustache and the deep voice, sounds like Ray? This was in that movie, hadn't heard it in years, but Edna St. Vincent Millay writes about death. She says, concerning the letting go of people that she loves, I am not resigned to the shutting away of loving hearts in the hard ground. So it is, so it will be, for so it has been time out of mind. Into the darkness they go, the wise and the lovely. Crowned with lilies and with laurel they go, but I am not resigned. Lovers and thinkers into the earth with you. Be one with the dull, the indiscriminate dust. A fragment of what you felt, of what you knew. Only a formula, a phrase remains, but the best of you is lost. I remember you, the answers quick and keen, the honest look, the laughter, the love, they are gone. They are gone, people tell me, to feed the roses. Ah, the roses, elegant and curled as the blossom, fragrant as the blossom for sure, I know, but I do not approve. More precious was the light in your eyes than all the roses in the world. Down, down, down into the darkness of the grave, gently they go, the beautiful, the tender, the kind, quietly they go, the intelligent, the witty, the brave, I know, but I do not approve and I am not resigned. They had cried until they couldn't cry anymore. In the span of just 24 hours, their world had been turned completely upside down. Their friend and their teacher had been unjustly accused, had been unduly taken into custody, had been unfairly tried, and then in one of the world's most infamous miscarriages of justice, He had been mercilessly condemned by a kangaroo court. Ripped from his young life and from theirs in a whirlwind of events that included betrayal by his closest friends, mockery, torture. The fact was Jesus was now dead. His life was over. His life was ended. 
endings. But this was not an end reserved just for Jesus. It was a devastating ending for these that followed him as well. It was the end of something that had promised so much. It was the end of something that they had invested so much energy into and they had drawn so much hope from. So for these women on that day, there was no framing what had happened. They were not resigned and they did not approve. There was no framing where this left them. There was no putting it into perspective. There was no chance of finding a silver lining. There was no way that they were going to take this and make this into one of life's cliched commas or semicolons or even periods. This was a blatantly vicious exclamation point. It was the cruelest of ends to something that they had thought was just getting started. Something they thought would last forever. You see, these women had believed in him. They had supported him. They had followed him. And now their journey with him was ended. Endings. Their journey was ended not with a coronation as they had expected, but it was ended with a crucifixion they could have never imagined. Frankly, you really have to hand it to them. As the mind-numbing turn of events had unfolded, as Jesus was led away silently to a cross, as his disciples waited on him to pull a rabbit out of a hat and redeem the whole thing and set Rome on its ears and ascend to his throne. Instead, he bled, he was bruised, and he was silent. Confused, the male disciples fled and hid. But these women, on the other hand, bravely and loyally followed him to the place of his torturous end. And they stayed with him, even to his death, until he breathed his rattling, congestive, heart failured last breath. And even after he died, the Bible said these brave women wouldn't leave. They stayed. And they watched two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, two religious leaders, throw the towel in on their life, come forward and literally beg the body of Jesus. They stayed there and they watched as the crowds dissipated as these two men wrestled his limp body from a cross and they watched as they carried it to a nearby grave. The gospel record says these women even then wouldn't go home. They followed the men and they carefully watched as they placed Jesus inside a freshly hewn tomb. And then adding insult to injury, they watched the men take a large stone and with all of their might, roll it until it was in place, blocking the entrance. As the men left, the women stared at this cruel ending. It is amazing how much of the gospel record is invested in this process. And it is also amazing how little we have paid attention to it. The Bible says that they stayed there and they stared at the cold stone. And I can only imagine it felt for them as though the world had stopped spinning. The only thing they could think was their hopes had just been nailed to a cross and their dreams were lying sealed hermetically sealed in this tomb and they sat there paralyzed by shock and grief they sat there silently at some point one of them recognized that the sun was setting and in so doing it was ushering in the Sabbath and they knew they were religiously out of place for the Sabbath so they pulled themselves together and they dutifully hurriedly made their way home for their weekly observance of Shabbat and as they went home, they carried with them the stabbing pain of this ending, this irreconcilable ending to which they did not resign. They carried home with them the slamming shut of a door in their heart. For the next 24 hours, the 24 hours of their Sabbath, they were supposed to rest, and maybe their bodies rested, but their minds would have none of it. Questions raced, doubts raged, fears assailed, Grief consumed. How could this have happened to him? This was not the way it was supposed to turn out. He was supposed to be the Messiah. And now they're left wondering, have we, were we wrong about him? Did we cruelly and unwittingly feed into nothing more than a delusion that he had bought into and now we've gotten our friend killed? 
what was real and what wasn't. So there they were, these women, trying to make sense of an ending, an ending that they lacked the framework and tools to make sense of. For 36 long hours, these women huddled in one of their homes. The gospel record said as soon as Sabbath ended and the sun was set, though they wanted to go to the tomb, they couldn't go to the tomb because it was too dark. So they spent Saturday evening, the evening that we are preparing Easter egg hunts and Sunday morning cantatas for. These women were not preparing for a resurrection. They were doing something else. They were not hastily moving from their death to a resurrection. They were taking time to tend to a part of the cycle that we often miss. It's the part that Carrie's tending to now. As she wrestles to move to Dallas, as she frames for herself and her daughter the hope of a new life, there is that space that you cannot, to your own peril, do you, race past. And so on that evening, the Bible says that these women devoted themselves, think about it, to preparing burial spices and perfumes. They were not preparing flowers and Easter lilies. For them, this was an act of decency. For them, it was a custom of mourning. For them, it was an exercise in their own healing. And I do want to say, for the last 2,000 years, the church has made a lot out of justification by faith. But on the next day, these two women would not be justified by their faith. They would be justified by their love. They did not go in great faith. They went in great love. And Paul said, now abides faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is not faith, it's love. And the longer the church lives with our message, the more we realize that we perhaps have discounted this element called love in the gospel record. Remember, the people who first experienced the resurrection weren't there because they believed, they were there because they were decent people tending to the burial of a friend. Decency and love goes a long way with God, maybe even further than great faith and perfect belief. So they go preparing these spices and perfumes and exercising their own healing. And this was their way of saying, Though things had not turned out the way we wanted, though things have not turned out the way we expected, though our faith has not resulted in what we thought it was going to result in, though his life did not give us all that it promised, though it has ended, they were standing there that day and they were saying, we are not going to do what the disciples did, sweep this under a rug, get busy again, go back to our nets and act like nothing ever happened. Something happened. And it may not have been what we wanted, but it happened, and it's too good to forget, and we are not going to move past it too quickly. The fact was for them, though it hadn't lasted forever, that did not undo that it had been there for a time, and that time was good, and that time was sacred, and what was, though it obviously had not gone the way they had planned. Anybody had something not go the way you planned? Anybody had a chapter that was so beautiful and wonderful you thought it was going to be the chapter that took you to the end of the book and then all of a sudden it unceremoniously closed on you? And yet they looked at that chapter and they said, though it has not been what we planned, it was too beautiful to abandon to the indignity of decay. Just because the past is the past and it didn't turn out to be your future doesn't mean it's got to stink. And they looked at his life and they said, it may not be what we wanted it to be, but we are not going to let it, we are not going to yield it to the stench and the indignity of decay. So these women on that Saturday night said, we will not leave him like this. Though he was dead and though he had carried away with him and though they might even have been angry to some degree at him, though he carried away with him to his grave this dream of theirs, Nothing, nothing, nothing could take away the fact that he had lived. Their dreams had been real, even if they never materialized into the waking world. 
And both he and their dreams deserve to be remembered, cherished, learned from, and honored. Christian people are so busy with the resurrection, we miss the fullness of the resurrection because we don't take time with our burials. We hear Jesus say, tolerated are those who mourn, but that's not what he said. He said, blessed are they who mourn. For grief is existential testimony to the worth of that which has been lost. Lament, obvious, actually lament is love song. And it is the highest form of worship. So with Sabbath ending after the sunset Saturday evening, the women were forced to work on the spices and to leave them in the unlit darkness of the night until Sunday sunrise. But the Bible says even before dawn, so urgent was it in their heart to get to the tomb that the Bible says as the sun was just beginning to come up, before it had crested above the horizon, they were there. As soon as they had the possibility of sight, all four gospels concur that as soon as there was light enough to see by, the women arrived at the tomb with their preparation of spices, and ointments, funerary, embalming practices. They arrived at the tomb, and it is amazing to me on that Sunday morning, out of all those he had touched, out of all those he had healed, out of all those he had taught, out of all those he had captivated, out of all those who called themselves disciples, only these made it that morning. And isn't it ironic that the first Easter Sunday was not a well-attended service? The big crowds were gone on the first Easter Sunday. And just Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, and perhaps one or two women more. And you know, it doesn't surprise me in the least that these women were the ones to whom the resurrected Jesus first appeared. There is something about their story that has such a ring of essential truth, it has captured me over the last few weeks. John's gospel, and I won't take time to go through the scripture with you in detail, but suffice to say, if you want to look at it, John's gospel in the 19th chapter says that when they crucified Jesus, the sun was going down, and the two men who were going to bury him had to interrupt what probably was their normal intention to take him to to a place where he would be buried with their paupers. But knowing that they could not do that and keep the Sabbath, you can see in the text that there was a garden right beside where he was crucified. And that garden was so close that one of them had a tomb there and he said, you know, let's just put him in my tomb. So Jesus was given the gift of a borrowed tomb. I highlight the fact that the tomb was very near the execution site to point out that there was, on that Sunday morning, no way to visit Jesus' tomb without the women having to go back to the place of their greatest pain. Don't miss this. That Sunday morning, the people who met the resurrected Christ met the resurrected Christ because they were brave enough to not live in denial, but to go back by the place that they never wanted to see again the rest of their life. Anybody have haunting memories? Anybody have places or streets or houses or people that you never want to see again because they conjure up too much pain for you? The reality is the women who experienced the resurrected Christ on that morning, they said, we've got to go to the tomb. And one of them must have said, but that means we've got to go. We've got to walk by the place. And they linked arms and they looked at one another and they said, we can do this. And they went back to the place of their greatest pain, the place where he was killed, the place where the cries still echoed in their ears. What is especially compelling about this is they would not let, please hear me, they would not let their heartbreak, their fears, their horrific memories keep them away and stop their act of kindness, this labor of love. They would not let their anxieties and sorrows paralyze them. In spite of all the difficulty, they literally faced their pain. They leaned into its biting jaws and they went back to the tomb, the absolute first chance they had. And I want to say this, fellas. It doesn't surprise me that they were women. With that said, I want to exercise some intellectual care here and I want to say While it doesn't surprise me in the least that these women were the ones to tend to the tomb and to subsequently 
be the first ones to experience the resurrection. The reality is women have known for a long time if they are not willing to face the most excruciating pain of life, our species would go extinct. Men whine about their 50-year-old doctor's visit and women roll their eyes. (laughs) While I admit it's true, I also want to say that I want to be very careful to not overplay stereotypical and stilted separation of what men and women are because I think there's a lot about the feminine that we have reserved only for the female and a lot about the male that we've reserved only for the male that are actually divine characteristics that if we were healthy, we could express both as human beings. But with that said, I do think there are undeniable distinctions that at least in certain contexts do appear between females and males. And I think some of these may be natural and good. Many others may be culturally, systemically, and unfortunately generated. But with that disclaimer given, I I, I wanna point out that the gospel record is crystal clear. When Jesus came fully to his hour of suffering and blood and despair and pain and grief and dying, it is not surprising to me that as the men left the messiness of that process, it was the women who stood watch as midwives, nurturing but not intruding, holding space but not directing The men, when he was alive, they held prominence. They loved his forceful ministry. They observed his power. They promoted his power. They strategized about political takeovers. When he flexed his muscles, they said hurrah. But the fact is, when Jesus in his final days and hours tapped into nonviolence, non-resistance, acceptance, and the pursuit of inner peace, the men scratched their heads and ran away and it was the women who were able to bear it. And the women with a quiet strength pressed in and this makes sense to me. It makes sense because women were and are historically if not inherently the bleeding ones, the penetrated ones, the bearing ones, the mistreated ones, dare we say the crucified ones. And somehow the beauty of their procreative gift of bleeding and the disgusting blight of misogyny and male dominance had graciously commingled in these women to create in them a capacity that the men didn't have to delicately, honorably, and profoundly hold space for a friend in his time of suffering. Whereas the men failed when their muscles failed, the women without the burden of great muscle pressed in They were the ones who stayed all the way to the bitter end of his torturous, bloody death, even returning to the tomb to tend to his cold, decaying body. The fact is this gender carries within their bodies a bleeding that creates life and in so doing steals them for the messiness of death. And may I say then, as one who loves the Bible, to call women the weaker of the sexes is perhaps the biblical author's most uninspired moment. So the women went that first Easter morning, bravely leaning into the tomb, bravely leaning into the pain, facing down their haunting memories and tending to the burial of a dream. They faced their ending head on and they didn't pull the covers over their face. Instead of running away, they ran headlong into it not looking for a resurrection, just tending humanely to a burial and wisely to an ending. And what they found there that morning was beyond unexpected. They went expecting to see a tomb. They went expecting to see a stone still in place. They they went expecting to see a memorial to their past, a reminder of all of their misguided dreams and how wrong they had gotten it. They went to see their failures rubbed in their face, but instead they found a stone rolled away. They found an opening in their pain, a liberation of their supposed failure. But interestingly, the angel that met them there didn't say, hey ladies, here he is, resurrection time. That's what we do. But the angels looked at the empty tomb and the angel said, he is not here, he has risen. 
But instead of saying, let me take you to him now, the angels came to them and said, you have courageously faced your fear and you don't have to be afraid any longer. This death, this ending no longer has sway over you. This mistake, this failure, this misguided dream, whatever it is, the close of this chapter does not have the final say in your life. And then profoundly the angel take them the angel took them by the hand and instead of saying come with me now to meet the resurrected Christ the angel knew the work of the gospel the angel took them by the hand and said I want you to come see the place where he lay come see the place of your greatest pain your greatest sorrow touch the place of your greatest wounding because no matter how much he resurrects, it will never undo that there was a Friday and there was a Saturday. No matter what happens on Sunday and Monday, it does not undo what Friday and Saturday are supposed to do in your life. Brothers and sisters, the resurrection is not the only part of the gospel that's good. There is soul-making work, there is a Christ-making process that happens in the burial on Saturday. And that male disciple part of me that wants to just run and get busy and grab nets and sweat and think and talk, fill the space. That part of me that doesn't want to sit in the silence because the silence says way too much. That part of me that doesn't want to be alone because I don't like the company that I hold there. That part of me in the gospel record is asked by the angels, before you meet a resurrected Christ, would you come with me? And he took them, made them look in the tomb. They literally went and they stood in the place of their pain. And the angel said, you need to touch it in all of its dark cruelty and you need to see that it's empty. Before you meet the fullness of Christ, you need to stand in the emptiness of a grave. It is the black velvet backdrop of the gospel against which the diamond of good news erupts and shine. Do not deny the black velvet backdrop. You need to see that it's empty. You need to see that it's lost its power over you. And as they stood there in that empty tomb, long before they met Jesus, they began to experience the power of resurrection, not just of Jesus, but of theirs. While the other disciples couldn't face the reality that unfolded that weekend in Jerusalem. Like many of us facing the close of chapters that we do not want to see closed, Last week in Seattle, I had a woman walk up to me who had just in, recent, in a recent moment lost a nine-year-old daughter, a 16-car pileup on the interstate, a nine-year-old little girl who had just donated her birthday for a well for clean water in Africa and had raised $220 and was so disappointed she couldn't get the full $300. Since her death, $1.2 million has been raised in her name. But that mother stood there. $1.2 million, 600 wells have now been dug. 60,000 people and children have clean water. But she was not resigned. All the water and all the roses could scarcely match the beauty of the eyes of a little girl. She was not resigned. Part of the good news is the admission. He doesn't come into this world floating and glowing. There is a cycle of life that God comes and says, I want you to see it in flesh. It is life, it is death. It is Gethsemane's, it is rejection, it is best friends leaving, it's unrequited longings and never having the relationship, it's, it's, it's people that I thought would be there not being there, it's chapters closing cruelly again and again and again. It is the whispering of nevertheless, 
It is the yielding to a cross. It is being carried by another. It is being wrestled from a tomb. Uh. While the other disciples couldn't face the reality that unfolded that weekend in Jerusalem and they ran as far as they could in the opposite direction of the trial, the scourging, the crucifixion, the lifeless body, the burial, the tomb, the decay of the body, these women leaned in knowing there is no way around the soul-making process of heartbreak and loss and failures and endings. You have to go through it. You have to face it. You have to see it. You have to touch it. You have to stand in it. You have to own it. You have to say to it, of all the horrible things you are, one thing for sure, you are mine. You are mine. This is my ending. This is my life. It is mine, and it will either do something to me or I will do something with it. I will either take it like an IV that feeds bitterness into me, or I will say, Jimmy, that all things work together for good, and this thorn is actually an IV that is opening me. It's a funnel that's opening me to a dimension of grace I would have never known. So then, Paul said, if I am afflicted, it is for your sake. For when I am greatly afflicted, I am greatly comforted. And I comfort others with the comfort wherewith I have been comforted by God. And I become a steward of my pain. Only then can new life come. And when Christians through the ages have tried to script, have, have tried to skip from a from a nativity with a star over it to an open tomb, we are skipping a process that is a soul-making process. And when we run from these harsh realities, the Good Fridays in our life and the silent Saturdays, you know as well as I do, when we run from these things, we only take them with us and away from the place of their transformation. Those crosses and those whipping posts, those buried tombs, they are the place of the resurrection. And I just want to say in closing I have found in my life again and again and afresh even recently that mercifully, lovingly, God has set this world up in such a way that you cannot run forever. He, Frederick Buechner said, is going to make Christ of us all or destroy us lovingly in the process. And even the destruction is a loving destruction. This is a Christ-making universe and a soul-making world, and I just want to say this to you. Resurrections don't happen in places of denial. The resurrection didn't happen on the seashore where the guys were getting back to business at hand. Resurrections don't happen in the places where you run to deny your pain. Resurrections happen when you brace yourself and you go back to the place of your greatest sorrow and you look at it and you touch it and even the angels have sense enough to know that you gotta go down into its gaping jaws and you have to stand there. And you have to look at the folded linens that remind you of a day gone by. This universe has a way of painting us into a corner where the tomb has to be seen and touched. But then and only then do the tombs in our lives begin to emptiness, empty, because our willingness to tunnel into the hard places actually creates the openings that become the drains that begin to drain them of their strength and sting. Even the men had to follow the women's way and face the pain before they could experience the resurrection. Two of the male disciples doubled back and were on their way kind of to Jerusalem on the way to Emmaus, circling near but not close enough. And the Bible said mercifully, Jesus went to the road and when he met them, notice, he didn't say, it's me. The Bible said, he looked at them and said, why are you so sad? <laughs> How wonderful of a therapist is he? The resurrected Christ didn't say, guys, I'm here, chin up. The Bible said he hid them, himself from them and looked at them and said, what are you talking about? And with their eyes glistening with tears, they said, have you not heard what happened in Jerusalem this week? 
and they begin to explain to Jesus how Jesus had died. A lot of time that's what prayer is for us, us explaining to God all the things God already knows. And as they explained to Jesus of their greatest heartbreak, they talked about how they thought they had hitched their wagon to the right one. They thought that they had finally bet on the right horse. They literally looked at Jesus not knowing it was him and they said, we thought this was he who was gonna redeem Israel and he did nothing but break our ever loving hearts. And Jesus walked with them. Was he torturing them? No. He was making their souls. Because it's not just resurrections that create Christ in us, it's thresholds. It's tapping into pain. It's admitting that this was and that all things work together for good. I used to think that all the good things work over here and all the bad things work over there. And then one day it occurred to me that the most important word in that text may not be good, it may be together. You know how the good works in your life? It works together. You know what it works together with? The bad. You take the sugar and the sweet stuff and the cinnamon and you mix it with the raw eggs and the bitter bacon powder and somehow under the heat of life, the cake comes out. Jesus said the wheat and the tare grow together and they don't grow separate and they grow together to the extent that when you start pulling on the bad, you know those bad things in your life, that part of your resume that you wish wasn't there, those things that have happened, the regrets that you wish you could undo. Remember all those things? You want me to tell you what they're doing right now? They're working together. And you know what they're working together with? They're working together with all the good stuff, the stuff that we need to be claiming in the I am. They're working together. And Jesus said, if you're so embarrassed and you so hate these bad parts of your life, you need to know that it was my wounds that heal. It was my stripes that heal. It were those parts of me, not the glowing and the floating and not the nativity and the star. It's the most painful parts of my life from which the healing actually flows. That's why when Thomas saw me, he didn't need to see me float. He didn't need to see me glow. He didn't say perform one more miracle. He said, I need to see the wound. And Jesus walked with them in their woundings. And he knew that many of us look at the bad parts of our life, the bacon soda, the bitter parts, the raw eggs, and we're always trying to clean those up. The problem is their roots are all tangled up with the good stuff and when you start pulling on the tares, Jesus said, it starts messing with the wheat. And at some point, you have to look at your life with all the graves and with all the tombs and with all the bad stuff, the regrets that are breathtaking, the injustices that are mind-numbing. And Ray, at some point with trust, you have to take your hands off of it and you have to say, I may not like it, but one thing it is, it's mine. And at some point you have to look at God and say, as many times as I've wanted to do this over, this is the raw material that you've got to work with in my life. I wish I'd given you better raw material to work with. And every time God smiles and said, that'll do just fine. That's why Peter on the seashore had to hear him say, lovest thou me? He took him back to the place of pain. Lovest thou me? And the third time Peter could hear himself the third time saying, blankety blank blank, I don't know him. So I close today with this question or a few questions that's begged by all of this. What are you doing with those mind-numbing injustices, the heartbreaking regrets, those parts of your resume that you would give both arms up to your shoulder to go back and do again. Those irrefutable, irrepressible things about your life. What are you doing with your pain? What are you doing with these endings, these close of chapters, these... What are you doing with the grief? What are you doing with the wounds? What are you doing with your disappointments? What are you doing with your failures? What are you doing with your disillusionment? What are you doing with your hopelessness? What are you doing with your depression? What are you doing with your despair? What are you doing with the death of your job, the death of your dream, the death of your marriage, the death of your relationship, the death of your identity, the death of... 
What are you doing with that festering unforgiveness that you daily nurse? What are you doing with that overwhelming regret that makes you engineer your own smallness because you think you don't deserve any better? Do you ignore it? Do you do like the male disciples and run away from it hoping it will just go away? As Dr. Phil, the great prophet said, how's that working for you? As my friend Dan Takini incisively asked in a group therapeutic session that I've been in with him on many occasions, a, a, a weekend retreat, Dan often will look at someone in front of the group and say, hey, we, we kind of feel that you do this. Do you see that? Most of the time you're too defensive and you don't want to see these parts of you that other people see. And most of the time people look back at Dan and they say, no, not really. Dan doesn't look at them and say, well, everybody else does. What's wrong with you? Dan looks at them and says, well, maybe, 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 maybe we're wrong. But let me ask you this. If it were true, this thing that you don't think is true, would you want to know? Ooh. Today we're reminded by Mary Magdalene and the other women that there is a better way than denial and that is to take our pain and discomfort, the closings and the endings of our life that overwhelm us, those things about us that seem unbearable and to hold them bravely and go headlong into the place of that grave and as the upward folk bound people have been saying for years or upward bound people have been saying for years, If you can't get out of it, you might as well get into it. So I just came down here to tell you today, there's more to the gospel than waiting on a resurrection. There's a way to wait on resurrections. And that is to deal delicately and kindly with the tombs and the burials and the deaths in your life. So in the sacred space of ending that we now stand, I wanna say this to you. Have the talk, make the call, Get the counselor, go to the group, join the gym, sign up for the class, get the help, reach out, open your mind, open your heart, look up, be honest, be curious, be courageous, be grateful, go to the place that you were gifted with. It was a tomb. Touch the tomb, step into the tomb, embrace this end, because if you will bravely go to the place of your tears, you will eventually find there the place of your laughter. If you will have the courage to face your demons, you will find that tombs are not just the sacred space that holds what was, they are the wombs that birth what will be. But before you experience the fullness of Jesus, You gotta be brave enough like those women to take the angel's hand and to stand in the emptiness. For it indeed is that black velvet backdrop against which the diamond of new life shines. I suppose I just wanted to come and encourage you about God's grammar, the old preacher said. When God puts a comma somewhere, don't ever put a period. But where God puts a period, don't ever put a comma. And just remember, wherever God puts a period, he always starts a new sentence. And it might even be a new paragraph. It might even be a new chapter. For crying out loud, it might even be a new book. You have no idea. But the equipment of resurrection is burial spices. Tend well, my friends. The good news is that he died and he was buried and he rose again the third day and then he was seen. Can you say amen? God bless you.